This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends, the greatest free-to-play dark fantasy RPG to come out in the last 200 years. Check out my link now to start your game with 100,000 silver and a free epic champion. And be sure to watch to the end of this video to find out more about this amazing opportunity. Down the street from every corner in America exists a beautiful place that will get you anything you please. A pack of Pringles, some Sunny D, a little Cheeto. You can just fill your cart with every flashy snack under the sun, and, as you check out, convince yourself that what you're doing exists merely within a vacuum. Sure, for instance, when I buy a bottle of Nesquik, I am funneling money into a company which has publicly admitted to using child slavery, whose recent CEO argued that water shouldn't be declared a human right because it makes it harder for people like him to declare a monetary value on water. As it continues to bottle said water in parts of California that are suffering from extreme drought just to save money. So how am I to convince myself that by loading these products into my cart and giving a small portion of my money straight to a conglomerate with no empathy or soul, that I am not actively congratulating and encouraging all of these horrible things? The answer is that I probably never think about these issues. Because despite Nestle's many problems being widely known, when I think of the name, the first thing that comes to my mind is the Nesquik Bunny. The fluffy, bright, cartoon character who danced around during our childhoods and got us hooked on thick, chocolatey goodness. And it's not like these two things are mutually exclusive, parts of different conversations. As much as the Nesquik Bunny exists to get you invested in a product, it also exists to convince you to not see Nestle as a series of corrupt suits and CEOs trying to milk a profit but instead as a wacky cartoon bunny who just wants all of us to have a good time. This is the true, unseen role of the mascot. To not only convince one to consume, but to trick us into not thinking about what that consumption really ends up meaning. I would argue one of the first brands to successfully latch on to the modern way of handling a mascot was the fast food chain McDonald's. In the late 1970s, McDonald's pioneered a series of commercials which presented a world known as McDonald Land, where different characters have adventures which eventually always end with them eating one thing or another at a McDonald's restaurant. These were commercials with a canon, which rewarded you for keeping up with past advertisements and the characters within. But more importantly, they featured a universe and a cast of characters who the kids watching would find themselves believing in. Specifically, Ronald McDonald, who represented great virtuosity and goodness. McDonald's could project those ideals onto their brand without really doing anything noteworthy or good. And children would become interested in that feeling, and would believe that the only way to keep it around would be to eat another Big Mac. It's really funny to think about how accepting we are of this standard in advertising, when at first people really didn't latch onto it at all. Arguably the first cereal to try and adopt a mascot was called Elijah's Manna, and featured the biblical character Elijah on its front cover. Quite literally in this case, the creators of this food were trying to make early 20th century consumers believe that there was something biblical about this cornflakes Cereal. This was immediately called Blasphemous, and they changed the cereal's name to Post Toasties. But I like to reflect on this because it reminds us of how equally silly modern food advertisements often prove to be. There's nothing about this brand of cornflakes that's inherently connected to God. You can't show up at the pearly gates and expect to get in because of whatever cereal you chose to eat in the morning. And in the same vein, it's ridiculous to think that eating a different brand of cornflakes will make you run faster, or will make you a better athlete, or will make you more healthy at all. But the true cause and effect doesn't matter. What matters is brand association. 
And that's a big aspect of why mascots are so favored by companies. They outwardly represent a certain idea, a concept, and also coincidentally, enjoy eating the product. And thus, there can be an implied correlation that the commercials never outwardly say, and the companies don't have to prove. Ronald McDonald represents compassion, love, and happiness, and he also loves eating burger. Tony the Tiger is a fit alpha furry chad who never gives up and trains with professional athletes, and he also eats this sugary bullshit. Some mascots are active, some adventurous, some brilliant and talented, and they all also just happen to love eating whatever food they've been designed to sell. But here's the problem that these companies end up coming across after they've been at it a little too long. Stagnation. Most people today have spent decades of their lives growing up in a place where advertisements are constantly present. And instead of reacting to ads like Pavlov dogs ready for a treat, they roll their eyes and continue about their days. And when that starts to happen, these brands realize how much their market value is based entirely on sets of cartoon characters, most likely created at the far end of the last century. And in the past few years, this has most clearly materialized through a sort of brand-led desperation, as the only way to get consumers reinvested is to force them to remember that their respective food IPs still exist. The most obvious example I can think of is Harlan Sanders, who's dug up from the ground every few months to go through a different, entirely embarrassing ad campaign. And while most of these examples are cringy as hell, they do work to some extent. I don't find myself thinking about KFC unless under the context of the latest attempt to bring Sanders back from the dead. Even when various other chicken-based food restaurants feud, I hear basically no one unironically arguing that KFC is a viable alternative. But whenever that southern, eccentric, gentlemanly corpse is hanged from the rafters and does a little dance, suddenly everyone's talking about the restaurant. The point is that in these last few years, advertising companies have been faced with a dilemma. They want to continue to convince viewers, more and more, that these brand-representing mascots are real people. And yet, the cynical nature of modern millennials and Zoomers means that it's not as easy to do this as it once was. One of the many things this has led to is an attempt by brands to personify their online social media accounts. Okay, but look how cute this area rug is from Walmart. I'm obsessed. Cute indeed, but I just couldn't help noticing your gorgeous feet. This mostly started out innocently enough, with the person running the Wendy's Twitter jokingly starting beef with other fast food accounts, leading to massive praise being given and people worshipping the Wendy's IP. But soon every mascot, foodstuff, or unlikely presidential candidate in the world realized that by hiring a few sarcastic interns and letting them run wild, they could see profits expand without a single penny being invested into the process. And before you knew it, random companies were having fake beefs, Moon Pies was on Suicide Watch, and KFC had a gaming Twitter account. I won't linger on social media brands too long, because they've been covered really well by more thoughtful and intelligent YouTubers before, but it's a really important step in the evolution of how these characters have been presented in modern times. Because all of this leads us directly to... Mr. Peanuts. And you could have it all. Next story is just nuts. Mr. Peanut is dead. Now, this is like a real story. Planter is apparently killing off his 104-year-old mascot in a pre-Super Bowl ad just a few weeks ahead of the big game. There is so much to say about Planter's attempts to assassinate their own mascot in order to breed a sadness in the general public. And also their eventual resurrection of the character as a bootleg version of Baby Yoda. I think the scene in the latter commercial, where several of the other branded mascots huddle together in mourning over the death of their friend, is the most disgustingly pathetic attempt I've ever seen of these companies trying to get their audiences invested in these characters being real. Which is saying a lot, because there's a lot of stupid, stupid competition. But the main reason that this campaign is so frustratingly obnoxious is that 
death is a real thing that exists in the real world. The very day this campaign was started, Monty Python legend Terry Jones passed away, after struggling with his health for several years. But when his death was announced, it almost felt like more people cared about the fucking cartoon peanut blowing up. But there's another side to this, something which I think has been born partially out of recent spite, but nevertheless deserves to be broken down in a full video. And that is the fact that I hate Mr. Peanut. Well, actually, if you'll excuse my pun, my thoughts about him have been sort of mixed. If you look at Mr. Peanut as a simple sketch meant to appear in newspaper ads, as a personified version of the product who smiles and points towards the larger set of text, then Mr. Peanut is one of the least offensive characters to ever be created. But every time Mr. Peanut is developed or personified past this, I find myself hating him with the strongest of passions. Why is that? Well, I think it stems from what he tends to accidentally represent in most of the attempts to add any sort of personality to him. Essentially, instead of being a character who distracts us from everything about corporations which are despicable, he ends up personifying those issues. And I think it might partially be the underlying accidental theme of, uh cannibalism. In the past few decades, it's become increasingly the norm for companies to create cinematic universes with consistent characters for their advertisements, harkening back all the way to the original McDonald's Land commercials. The most common archetype for these is that animated personifications of the represented product live in a world where they have to avoid being eaten by regular people. These commercials continually represent a world where systematic injustice is the general norm for an entire race of intelligent, sentient, thinking people. Specifically, the iconic M&M commercials show a reality where M&Ms have to go throughout their lives in heavily populated areas while avoiding being killed and consumed by humans. Seemingly, they have no protection. No law or police which cares to help them fight off their constant predators, alongside the added subtext that female M&Ms also face constant sexual harassment without anyone really caring. So then I said, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm flattered that you love chocolate, but I'm here strictly in a professional. I think the most iconic of these recent commercials features the red M&M being magically made into a human, causing him to immediately celebrate that for the first time in his life. No one wants to murder and consume his flesh. <laughs> Nobody wants to eat me! The underlying implication of these narratives is that while this system is disgusting and without justice, there is nothing that the M&Ms can do about it. They are just people who live in a world that is inherently broken and cruel but have no power to do anything about it. Even when they work with the very company that is apparently trying to monetize the existence of this issue, we're given the idea that it's sort of their only choice. Maybe working with the M&M's company gives them protection. Or maybe it's the only job in their universe they can find where no one is constantly trying to eat them. Why this is important is that while Mr. Peanut is shown to exist in a world where peanuts are sentient, and where there are people who eat peanuts, he has never been personified in the same way as the characters in the M&M commercials. He is not a casualty of a system of cruelty. He is not a regular person in a world that he has no influence to change. He is the top dog. He runs the Planters Peanuts Corporation. He's not the victim of abuse. He is the creator and profiteer of abuse. Often in modern Mr. Peanut commercials, Mr. Peanut will be seen being at conflict with other sentient nuts, and the spot will end with one of the other nuts being eaten by a human being. In one of the most memorable of these spots, we are introduced to the artist formerly known as Mr. Peanut Butter, now going by the name Peanut Butter Doug. Peanut Butter Doug, it transpires, is Mr. Peanut's stunt double for commercials, and will essentially be the stand-in that is crushed and turned into peanut butter. This image 
of Mr. Peanut ignoring his associates and yakking away on his phone as he celebrates his fame, while a worker under him injures himself over and over again, all for the sake of creating a product with Mr. Peanut's face glued to the side, is perhaps one of the most accidentally apt representations of how CEOs and general corporate suits actually operate. Indeed, just the mere existence of Mr. Peanut as a character who crushes the bones of his brothers in order to sell them for a profit is generally a really good metaphor for how capitalism works. And it's hard to represent this character in any way but this, because even his design seems to greatly hearken to the cartoonish perception of the capitalist fat cat, which it should be said first started to appear in newspapers the very same year that Mr. Peanut did. In researching this topic and trying to get to the roots of Mr. Peanut as a character, one of the first things I ended up doing was searching through old newspaper archives and trying to find the oldest examples of him appearing that I could. And I found a lot of weird, interesting stuff that I've never seen brought up before. Anyways, I wanted to highlight my favorite discovery in going through these archives. Mr. Peanut's Nutty History. This was an ad campaign in the late 1930s which showed Mr. Peanut going on time travel adventures through different pages in history, intervening to rewrite as he pleases. Uh, pretend I made a quantum leap joke here, unless the quantum leap joke in your head is kind of overplayed, in which case pretend I made a Voyagers joke that you didn't understand because you've never watched Voyagers. Here's the first comic we're going to read. I want to point out that in this first panel, these two characters are murdering some guy. His back is turned to them, and uh, no one in the comic ever brings up that they murdered the guy, which I think is a really horrifying representation of just how normalized violence against Native Americans was at this point in American history. Mr. Peanut's Nutty History, Priscilla and John Alden. John, would ye believe that the brave Miles Standish is afraid of women? Nay, Miles, I believed ye feared nothing. Aye, <sighs> I do, John. I am in love with Priscilla, but I have not the courage to propose. She is fair buxom and a blithe damsel, Miles. I could go for her myself. John, thou art my pal. Would ye pop the question for me? Okay, I'm good at that. Okay, then he goes to Mr. Peanut's store and he buys some peanuts, I guess, and then later he's back at Priscilla's place. Here's some planters peanuts for ye, Priscilla. I have a question to ask ye. Oh, thou art a darling, John. I adore them. Oh, Miles couldn't get up pep enough, so he sent me over to ask. Will thou marry him? But twas ye who brought me these delicious peanuts. Why not speak for thyself, John? <laughs> darling, will ye? Yes, my love. Zounds and odds, bodkins! What's this? Too bad, Miles. Take my advice, and get another girlfriend, and some planter's peanuts. Mr. Peanut cucked a guy. Okay, so that's the most outwardly strange one, but the reason I felt the string of comics was worthy of being brought up is the continuous theme of, uh, racism. This is a real panel from a real Mr. Peanut ad that I have not edited at all. I hope you guys would understand this isn't this isn't the sort of thing I would edit into existence. I'd be I, you gotta be a sick puppy to make something like this. I guess it shouldn't be that shocking to me that a comic about Mr. Peanut intervening in historical moments made during the 1930s is going to have some overtly racist perspectives. But it's surreal knowing how scrubbed down and clean the brand tries to treat the character today. For instance, here's a comic where Mr. Peanut supports and assists in colonialism. I'm going to read this one myself because I'm not going to subjugate any of my friends to being associated with this one. Come across, you buzzard. Where is all that gold you've been hoarding? Uh, this next character's dialogue is written in a very specific dialect, which is implying me to read it with a very specific voice that anyone can do. Uh, as an act of protest, I'm going to read it with no voice whatsoever. Me got no more gold, but me still got more valuable treasure. That's right, pal. Monty has something that makes gold look silly. There you are, Cortez. Planters fresh double-roasted peanuts. 
They'll give you enough pep to paddle your boat back across the Atlantic. Shades of Columbus, this is a discovery. Boy, wait till old King Ferdinand gets a load of these fresh planters' peanuts. He'll have enough energy to chase the Moors out of Spain. This comic implies that planters' peanuts were actually an invention of the Aztec Indians, and that Mr. Peanut went back in time to assist in the entrapment and enslavement of the population, so he could then go back to the present and sell the peanuts as his own invention. <laughs> but I think, arguably, one of the worst ads I found was one of the first. Mr. Peanut began appearing in newspapers in 1917, and in the months following this, multiple different ads featuring the character in different situations started to appear. So in this strip, Mr. Peanut is seen looming over a group of black plantation workers, seemingly angrily wagging his cane at them as he barks orders. Uncle Ned, the planters want none but the biggest and finest peanuts. I, I know I'm presuming an aggressive tone, but I mean, look at his face. Look at his face. He looks so evil. So, it should be pointed out that the name Uncle Ned is a reference to an old minstrel tune from 1848 about a black slave. Uncle Ned is a controversial song, because while some historians argue that it was one of the first pieces to ever have subtle anti-slavery messaging, it still maintains the general aesthetic of most other racist content of the time. Slightly slipping past having that discussion, one has to wonder why one of the first Planters Peanuts ads to actually use Mr. Peanut chose to make reference to a poem about a black slave when showing the workers who were in fact harvesting their actual products. Because I feel like it wasn't under the woke context that some historians want you to look at that character through today. You know, it's kind of funny that brands and mascots usually avoid being political out of fear of alienating their audiences, except for when it comes to briefly popular bad political opinions in the past, which they just don't have the foresight to see any faults in. How many other examples of this exist in the wild, do you think? Did Mr. Clean advocate for a white ethnostate? Did Chester Cheetah support don't ask, don't tell? Despite how terrible a lot of these old ads are, none of these represent the moment that I realized that I really, really hate this character. I will now be reading verbatim excerpts from an article on Adweek from 2017. The inside story of how Mr. Peanut learned to dab and got nominated for a Shorty Award. Mr. Peanut, Planter's monocle-wearing, top-hatted mascot, had taken his place atop the Notmobile in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, like countless other branded mascots at the event. Mr. Peanut spent his time bowing, waving, and variously acknowledging the 3.5 million people lining the parade's two-mile route through Manhattan. Unlike the other mascots, however, Mr. Peanut had been preparing a special move. Right as the Nutmobile rolled past the Macy store in Herald Square, Mr. Peanut did a dab. It happened in an instant. A slight head bow into the crook of one elbow, with the other arm extended. That might have been the end of it, too, were it not for a spectator who created a gif of the moment and posted it. Now, after months of getting shared all over the web, the gif is up for a shorty award. Today, the brand's marketing team is unveiling an Academy Award-style for your consideration video and related promotional posters, all in hopes of upping Mr. Peanut's chances of winning. This video purports to tell the backstory of how Mr. Peanut learned to dab. It takes viewers into a dance studio where a demanding instructor is putting the anthropomorphic legume through a torturous rehearsal that isn't going well. In frustration, Mr. Peanut takes a break and gazes out the window down to the street where he spots some teenage girls. Oh no! Where he spots some teenage girls dabbing. Oh. Tom Hanks, Prince Harry, LeBron James, Ellen DeGeneres, and Hillary Clinton have also been spotted dabbing in the past year or so. This is the worst article I've ever read! As we as a civilization looked upon this moment, as important to our evolution as the first tool made by man, one quandary found itself burning into my mind. 
If corporations are really people, like so many would like us to believe, do they bleed? Can we kill Mr. Peanut? The plan was so simple. I wait for Mr. Peanut to take a trip down a treacherous path, and I cut the brakes to the nutmobile. And then, I simply wait for him to fall into my trap. And it worked. It really worked. I busted that nut. Oh wait, except he came back as a fucking baby, I forgot. I can't believe so many people like instantly bought into Baby Nut like it was the greatest craze to ever be born. But it must be popular, right? Look at this. It took Disney like six months to have any Baby Yoda merch, and meanwhile planters instantaneously had like a dozen different things you could buy. Oh wow, Baby Nut is so cute, I have to buy all of these things. Baby Nut is not cute. He's not even a baby. He is a multinational conglomerate trying to convince you that he is a baby. The moment his wallet wills it, he shall unleash his true voracious form and consume your soul before returning back to his hollow mockery of a shell to fool more. We must kill Baby Knight like we killed his father before. Down the street from every corner in America, exists a desolate spot of waste and debris. Clutter fills our streets, our waters, and our homes. The remnant of invaders we've allowed to linger for far too long. In the ruins of our shortest of shortest passions, of our dances with projected joy, one conclusion comes to the forefront. Maybe... It's time for ads to die. This video has been sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Hey, punk. This is a robbery. Give me all your money. Sorry, man. Don't have any money. I gave it all to the IRS last week. But what I do have is the action, adventure, and intrigue that can be found in just the simple palm of my hand. Are you talking about Raid Shadow Legends? That's right, Raid oh, Shadow oh, Legends. Shit. I love that game, dude. I love Raid Shadow <laughs> Legends. It is simply one of the best mobile games I think I've ever I've ever played. Had the pleasure of playing that game. That is Raid Shadow. Raid Shadow Legend. Yeah, so what we got here is we got these shards. You yeah. can open them up, and that gives you a hero. Kind of popped right out, huh? Let's see who we got this time. Oh, that's, yeah. a, that's a good one. Scared me. Really I haven't crazy. had one of those before. One thing I like to do is, this is brilliant, I can't believe they do this. Yeah. They got a sparring pit here. In universe, your character is sparring and like training. Oh. You pop over there, every few hours, they That's just level up and it's just like, You don't yeah. even have to do anything. Literally, you know, when I'm out on the day, yeah. when I'm going doing grocery shopping, when I'm filing mm -hmm. my taxes, I still have Raid Shadow Legends on the mind. Yeah. I'm thinking like how many minutes until that timer's yeah, up. That's probably what I'd be thinking too, like at work, I'm just counting down, you know, the hours until I can play yeah. Raid. Shadow Legends. I'm gonna pick this like that guy we just unlocked. Yeah, I would. I want to see him at work. I want to see what he's capable of loading screen. I'm just burdening right now with the anticipation because it's oh there it is, and look at these graphics as well. Yeah, it is. You look know? at that. You can like move it around and yeah. you can shift it. Let's you can see what's going it around. Shift it around. On a drawbridge here. I hope no one falls off. See, the best people have attacks where you can attack everyone in one turn. See, look, this one, I'm gonna attack everyone twice. Give him those, give him those arrows. There's two different aspects to this game in terms of playing it right. You need to level up your characters, get them mm -hmm. equipped with the right armor, and of course you also need to know like what moves to play. If if it's too much for you, if the strategy's too hard, yeah. you can actually set it to automatic mode. That's, and that the, would be the good AI, for me. Uh, the AI will like choose yeah. the best moves Let in the situation. Let the computer do the work. Yeah. And the idea is then you can concentrate on being like, okay, so if the computer can't beat this level, then I'm not equipping these characters right. I should try and update some of their shielding. Uh, I have done a pretty good job of getting these guys up to some standard. Mm -hmm. They're blowing right through these uh, 
but Leads you know, the, the further you go, the, the harder it gets. That's, so you gotta. That's the way it goes. I've gained so much from just uh, taking a part of my day out to experience raid. It's it's really helped me, you know, grow as a person. I feel, and obviously, you you know, mm -hmm. you're on the path to giving up a life of crime because because of this this moment we've had. So it's. Oh yeah, I mean, I might just kill you. Take this phone. Get out of here. But I'm. I'm I mean, I do love Raid Shadow Legends. That's true. And truly, truly people, who doesn't love Raid Shadow Legends? It's the greatest dark fantasy RPG to come out in the last 200 years and the greatest video game of all time. What I love most about this game, alongside its graphics and all its great characters, is how you get rewarded for sticking with it and playing every single day. It's a nice thing to mess around with whenever I have some downtime, and because of its existence on desktop and mobile, I can take it on the go throughout my day. I'll play a little in public, but then I get to come home and I log into my laptop and I continue from the story where I left off. It's so exciting! I took this sponsor entirely as a punchline, but I am officially addicted to playing Raid Shadow Legends, and I want to keep being paid to play it until the day I die. So I hope you guys will humor me by checking it out for yourselves. So go ahead and mosey on down to those links in the description right now. If this is your first time signing up, you can get 100,000 silver added to your account and a free epic champion, Jotun. Everyone, I want you to go down to those links in the description. I want you to get yourselves this big titty warrior, and I want you to take good care of him. He'll be in your hands, and I'm trusting you to keep him safe. But this is only available for the next 30 days, so you have to act fast. Once again, go to those links in the description and get started on Raid Shadow Legends today. Yeah, real quick, this is the Patreon outro. <laughs> I know this video is going to be pretty long, so I, I won't keep you guys too far past the bell. I just wanted to thank all of my Patreon supporters who have supported me while I took a couple weeks off of doing YouTube. You know, if it wasn't for you guys, I, I wouldn't be able to do stuff like that. I wouldn't be able to take some casual breaks so I can have fun making YouTube content again. I want to quickly mention that I've officially started posting exclusive content to my Patreon page. For instance, right now I have a Patreon Q&A that's live, and I'll be doing one of those every single month. Also, I'm planning on posting some bloopers for those raid skits you saw today, and I'm gonna start doing a bunch of other stuff, and you can check all of that out for just one dollar right now. And of course, if you pledge five dollars, you get to be in the credits and all those other things, yada yada yada. With that, I've been quitting reviews, and that's all you need. Between meals, when you get that letdown feeling, eat double roasted Planus peanuts. They'll give you two and a half hours extra pep, shipped out under refrigeration. They're shipped out under refrigeration, which is a weird selling point. It's like they're Wendy's. Nobody wants a warm sack of nuts.